And now, as last speaker, I want to invite Alejandro Spiota, one of the members of our neurointerventional team at the Medical University of South Carolina. It's a group that is very busy in stroke, one of the busiest in the country and in the world. So I want him to give us an update in the management of acute stroke. Alex? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there another laser pointer by chance? Great, awesome. And thanks again, Claudia, for having me. It's great to be here. It's my third time here. And I'm extremely excited this time because I get to talk about a very exciting topic, the update on acute stroke treatment. And um, I'll, show, I'll show just last week, in fact, it was a historic week. Three trials were presented at the stroke conference, all showing overwhelming efficacy for thrombectomy over medical management. All three trials were stopped early. So it's been a huge, huge week for our field. And we definitely needed it, as I'll show you. These are my disclosures. As far as an outline, we're going to talk about IVTPA, which remains the only drug approved for acute stroke treatment. Talk about the prior, first, second, third generation thrombectomy devices. Speak about the importance of patient selection. So forgetting any time constraints, but actually individualizing the, the time window of the specific patient using dynamic imaging, for example, CT perfusion and how that's been incorporated by more and more centers across the world. Then I'll review the latest and uh, the latest and greatest as far as thrombectomy devices, direct aspiration, which we pioneered at MUSC. I'll talk a little bit about the problems with the negative trials, and these negative trials really plagued and haunted us the last two years, and the naysayers enjoyed rubbing it in our faces, but now we finally have some very positive and strong level one evidence for what we do. And then I'll finish up with the summary of the recent trials. So as far as stroke treatment, again, uh, IVTPA remains the only FDA-approved drug. And it initially was in a three-hour window. That was extended to four-and-a-half-hour windows. And that was a large and uh, pivotal NIDS stroke study that was published in 1995. Over 600 patients were randomized to get placebo or TPA. And important to know, these are 600 patients imaged with a CAT scan if there was no hemorrhage and no huge obvious infarct, although we know a non-contrast CT is very poorly sensitive for early infarct. As long as they didn't have a huge hemorrhage or a huge infarct, these patients were included if somebody thought they had a stroke. These included large strokes, small strokes, seizures, no strokes at all. But overall, the IVTPA day, a group did it better. So you can see, as expected, higher um, ICH rate in the TPA group. But despite that, a larger percentage in those getting TPA with a good outcome, a modified ranking less than one, 39% versus 26%. So this all had limitations. This is obviously a huge, huge fi finding, and IVTPA had, until recently, remained the only treatment option. And then, like I mentioned, that three-hour window, and I'll mention that three-hour window was picked out of a hat. There was really no rhyme or reason, but really, that's, whenever you have a time window like that, it really sticks in people's minds. And that three-hour window was later extended to four-and-a-half-hour windows. But if you look at um, IVTPA and those strokes that we think we can help with thrombectomy, those are the larger strokes, more proximal, larger vessel occlusions, bigger clots. IVTPA does not really work well in those. You can see in this study, very low rates of recanalization in these larger vessel occlusions, although the strongest predictor for good outcome is recanalization. So IVTPA does not work in these, and the patients do poorly. So you look at ICA terminus, 4% recanalization with IVTPA, basilar, where patients do very poorly, 4% and 30 for M1. So overall, in the more proximal large vessel occlusions, these are the ones that we deal with primarily with thrombectomy, IVTPA very ineffective. This is in a group of patients, a, a subset of them that actually had uh, vascular imaging with CTA and then some type of vascular imaging following IVTPA. So again, recan rates are very low. And those who are lucky enough to have recan with IVTPA, those did the best, but overall poor recan rates with IVTPA alone. And we know the normal neuronal function requires blood flow to maintain both um, energy and oxygen requirements. As that blood flow is diminished, for example, with a large vessel occlusion, you will get initially reversible injury, and that's the so-called penumbra. This you can intervene and reverse before it becomes a core infarct. The difficulty lies in the patients when they get the blood flow reduction to the point where they get the penumbra. They are clinically manifesting the way exactly the same way as they, if they've already had an infarction. So these patients have an NIH stroke scale, and an exam looks the same whether they're in the reversible state or the irreversible. 
but our job is to identify those in the reversible and offer them therapy to get them back to restored function rather than the irreversible, obviously, where only they'll only get the risk of the procedure without any benefit. And the degree of time that a patient may have from progressing from reversible to irreversible largely degree on the, the degree of collaterals. Obviously, the circle will have direct collaterals, but there's also indirect from, for example, the anterior cerebral artery to the middle cerebral artery. We also have posterior circulation to anterior circulation, not pictured here, also external carotid to internal carotid artery anastomosis. Here's a great example. M1 occlusion, ACA's filling, ACA's wrapping around, starting to fill some of the MCA territory and that ACA is wrapping around and really helping out that MCA territory. This is someone with strong collaterals, someone you'd expect to have a larger time window. Again, the three-hour time window for IBTPA makes no rhyme or reason. But with this degree of collaterals, you expect that this patient will be able to exist in the penumbra state before dropping into the infarction state. So what we do is we try to identify these patients. So we do vascular imaging and dynamic perfusion imaging. We look at the vessels, for example, on CTA, you see in a vessel occlusion here, this is a proximal large vessel occlusion. You see this whole area MCA infarct, I'm sorry, MCA territory that's at risk for infarct. And on the blood volume here, you see a small subcortical core infarct. So this we cannot reverse, but this entire area, when you subtract it to, is at risk. So this would be a patient who would be a very strong candidate for thrombectomy if you caught him at this time period. And we've studied this strategy using CD perfusion, again, regardless of any time constraints. We did a multi-center just under 250 patients from four study sites around the U.S. And these are patients we stratify in eight hours. That was a traditional window for any thrombectomy devices, and then beyond eight hours. On average, these were almost 10 hours, so well beyond any kind of time window that several years ago this would have been pretty outside the box, pretty aggressive. But even these that are well beyond the eight hours, if you look at the numbers as far as modified ranking zero to two, hemorrhage rates, NIH mortalities, they're identical. So using a perfusion-guided triage evaluation system, anybody who even beyond the eight hours can benefit just as much from, th from thrombectomy as those in the earlier time points. So we learned a couple lessons. Number one, patient selection, for example, the dynamic imaging CT perfusion is critical. But at the same time, can we actually get better? So we're getting better at picking the patient, but can we ourselves get faster and better at opening that vessel, which is the key? And we have. So the first thrombectomy device that was uh, approved for stroke was the Mercy Retrieval device. Looks like a little corkscrew, a little pigtail. Released in 2005. Before this, all we did was catheter delivery and TPA drip, or microwire, microcatheter manipulation. But this is really the first device, exciting when it came out and you essentially interact with the thrombus, deploy this little pigtail device, which engages that clot, and then you try to remove it. And there's variations where you put a distal axis catheter or even a balloon guide catheter like they show for the carotid cases to try to have flow reversal. But essentially, there are problems with them. One is that the revascularization rates were pretty low, so we're talking like 45% getting the vessel open. And also, when you pulled on that, you caused a lot of traction. So here's the roadmap, and here's the the active floral um, snapshot superimposed, you can see the tortuosity, which was, and now has been straightened by pulling on this. The M1 is a horizontal. You want to be pulling horizontally, but you're really pulling vertically down at the thigh. So that really, the vectors are really suboptimal. You can see the straightening of all these vessels, and patients really don't like that. That's one of the pain-sensitive structures. Move vessels around, the patient started waking up, groaning. So this led also to, to the widespread institution of general anesthesia for stroke interventions, which also has some down effects. Not only did it, did it add procedure times, but having to induce anesthesia, there was also a high incidence of blood pressure lowering with the induction of general anesthesia, and then also some concern for toxicity from the agents themselves. So the second generation was the uh, penumbra separator system, a family of catheters in varying sizes to get from more proximal to more distal. This video is not, are you able to hit that video? Essentially, you deliver this larger catheter right up to the clot, and with this little spade-type device. It's okay, we'll skip it if it won't work. You, would, you basically introduce this device in and out of the clot and to macerate it while applying direct aspiration to this catheter just next to it, and you try to break up the clot and try to suck it up the catheter before it flies downstream. This is better, this is the second generation. But again, limitation was a downstream emboli. You could break it up and fragment it, but you didn't always capture them. Um, and also, there were moderate revascularization rates. So it went from 45% rates to about 55, 60, 65% were doing better, but still not what we think would be uh, optimal or, or satisfactory. 
Here's a case in M1 occlusion. You go up, use a separator device, now you got that M1 open. But now you have an M2 occlusion because some of that fragment was not caught. Now you have to work on that M2, and then you go out, and now you have an M3 occlusion, so so forth and so forth. So the current generation mechanical thrombectomy devices are the stent retrievers, and these were released about 15 or so months ago. This is a stent that's essentially tied to a wire, and the idea is you put a catheter into the clot, and you deploy this stent. It does two things. One, as it outwardly opens, it engages and cuts into the thrombus to really get purchase in the clot. It, what it immediately does for you, actually, in many cases, it does a, a temporary bypass. So actually, if you do a contrast injection or a puff, you'll see that there's anterograde flow has been restored. So sometimes that's, a, that's an appealing <clears throat> strategy if you can sort of reset the time clock, for example, for a patient. But as it engages a the clot, then you remove it and try to remove the clot. And it worked a lot better and those rates went up to 75% revascularization. And those are the devices that were used in the most recent trials. But we at, at MUC at pioneered a new, a, new, um, a new strategy which is simplified and more effective and I'll show faster and also safer, using these larger um, bore catheters that were designed to deliver the stents and deliver the thrombectomy devices. And the name of the game is to try to deliver the largest possible catheter in the artery that the clot resides in. So that's M1 or M2 or M3, we have different size catheters. If you can get the biggest possible catheter way up distally, and it's an aggressive move until we had the technology to do it safely, put that catheter mouth right up to the clot, engage it, and with direct aspiration actually grab it and remove the clot in one piece. So again, this is the evolution. With Mercy, we tried to engage it with the corkscrew. The vectors were awful because you were pulling down here. What you wanted was pulling in this direction. Later on, distal axis catheters were used to try to increase those vectors and add aspiration to it. The penumbra separator was an improvement, but still had limitations. Stent retrievers initially were working better, but they had some of the similar biomechanical problems of the Mercy device. So we placed these distal axis catheters right up to the stent retriever to both allow the vector to be in the same direction of where the catheter is and also apply direct aspiration. And then we just bypass the stent retriever, engage the clot with the catheter itself, and then pull it out. And there's an illustration of our technique, getting largest, the largest possible catheter as far distally as possible. This often requires triaxial and quadraxial uh, catheter and wire systems. Get engaging the clot with direct aspiration and removing it. We found this pretty effective. Here's an example, an older male with left side of weakness, last known normal at 10 p.m., presents the following morning in outside of any, any time window. On non-contrast CAT scan, you see a hyperdense MCA sign, maybe a little bit of a subcortical core infarct there, a little hypodensity. On the perfusion imaging, there it is, that core infarct. You can see the entire MCA territory is at risk. This is a great candidate. He's got a lot of territory we can salvage. And on, on angiography, he's actually got a carotid terminus occlusion. You can see lucency, here's the clot, and here's our intermediate catheter. Here's a video so you can focus on this AP view. Our guide catheter is off the screen. Intermediate catheter is gonna be doing the work. But to deliver, we have a microwire and an O2.5 velocity catheter which you deliver to the clot. And over that, you'll see this intermediate catheter very nicely. It's traveling on the carotid siphon, carotid terminus past the PCOM, and actually right into the M1. Even just a couple years ago, these catheters could not do that. We had to do a lot of tricks and acrobatics to get them to do that. It would take a lot of time. Now, it, for the most time, for most cases, it's as fast as that, which is really a huge advancement. And we got out this clot in one pass. Huge clot, and we look at that clot, and here's full revascularization, 30 minutes from the time of st sticking the needle in, not from the time of having the guide up, or not from the time for starting the thrombectomy, 30 minutes from the time we punctured the artery. And a post-operative, uh, post-treatment CT, you can see the core infarct, but the uh, entire MCA that had been at risk, but we identified it being re reversible, not irreversible, in fact, has been salvaged and spared. And again, looking at that clot, you know that IVTPA is not going to work on that. From IMS3, one of the negative trials from a couple years ago, they looked at probability of recanalization, not going to happen, could happen. The length of the hyperdense MCA is a surrogate for the length of the clot. You can see any, you get to two or three, these are the dots of where they, they distributed. You get to four millimeters and that rate's dropping. By the time you get to eight millimeters, zero. In fact, none over eight millimeters were recanalized, and these, we do all of ours, which are greater than eight millimeters. None that were eight or greater were recanalized with IBTPA alone, and that was 43% of the patients in that study. So IBTPA is not effective, but we need to identify and target these patients. So again, with this direct aspiration, and we got to name it, 
uh, was a direct aspiration first pass technique. We initially published in our first 30 or so cases, just initially a safety study. Here's some examples, a basilar and PCA occlusion. Go up in 10 minutes from groin axis, we get full recanalization of basal apex and the PCA origins. Here's the clot that we removed. This is a more distal MCA occlusion, 45 minutes with a small catheter, three max, again, sizing the catheter to the size of the vessel, fully recanalized. Here's a more proximal MCA occlusion. This is seven minutes from the time of growing puncture. Here's the occlusion, here's the revascularization. And this is interesting, it almost has the bifurcation built into it, it looks like a little saddle embolus. You can see that alone would be almost eight or nine millimeters. We know IBTPA will not touch this. And here's really the most impressive one of them all, um, an M1 occlusion here, the 5 max intermediate catheter with direct aspiration. You can see that very long clot, full revascularization uh, in 11 minutes. So we partnered up with um, several other centers that we partner with frequently around the country, and we published the first 100 um, cases, adapt fast, so the direct aspiration first pass techniques for acute stroke thrombectomy. And our results um, of the first 100 cases, these were all comers, the first 100, and then we stopped. Comparing um, the stent reverse, the current generation, this is sort of the newer generation, but comparing to the current generation, a couple of things to note, the Tiki 2B or 3, that's a score of the degree of revascularization. So greater than 50% is 2B and, and um, 3 is 100%. You can see these rates were much higher than with Mercy and the separator, so much better than the first and generation devices, 75, 85%, 82%, very, very competitive rates. We can see 95% with the direct aspiration technique. Not only was it effective, it was also very fast. So many of these did not report the times. The NASA registry did, 50 minutes, but that's the asterisk that was 50 minutes from the time the guide was in the carotid. We had 37 minutes overall from the time of growing puncture. And not, that, not just that, it was also safe. So, so if you look at the device-related complications down below here, had the lowest rates, 2%, and symptomatic hemorrhage is also very low. So what's great is fast, and fast is good in stroke. We know from MI, um, IMS 1 and 2, also those negative trials, where they took a long time to get patients to the lab, and it took a long time to open up those vessels, not because they weren't trying, but because they had worse devices, and they weren't perhaps as aggressive, that every 30 minute delay from the time from symptom onset to getting that artery open led to a 10% decrease every time you chop 10% off the, the legs, 10% decrease of a uh, good outcome. And again, comparing our times at MUC compared to the, the registries with um, 120 to 150 minutes, this is taking you know, over two, two hours and greater than two hours. In our hands with the penumbra aspiration system, on average 85 minutes, with the stent retriever system, 52 minutes, but then now with the direct aspiration in those first 100 or so cases, 37 minutes on average. And again, not only is it fast, but it's safe and efficacious. So again, overall, the recanalization rates, the most competitive, 95% of the time, and achieving good outcomes, zero to two modified ranking, almost 50% of the time. Again, symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage rates are extremely low, 1.4%. It doesn't apply as much traction as the stent retrievers, where you're dragging, there's a lot of friction, and the Mercy, where you really put traction on those arteries. You could evolve lenticular strides, for example, and cause basal ganglion hemorrhages. We just were not seeing that with this technique. It's also cost-effective, which is almost as important nowadays as anything else. With the penumbra separator system, you can see the cost going up with stent retrievers, so stents are expensive. Now we're just using the catheters, which we would have just used to deliver the stent. We're basically subtracting the stent. You can see the cost differential there. And another thing is that it's painless <clears throat> as well as fast. So as we started doing this, we stopped using general anesthesia, which is great, because procedures are faster, and we didn't want to wait for general anesthesia. We felt we could, do the, we could be done with the procedure, essentially. So now it gives us the added bonus that we don't have the hypotension during anesthesia, that we don't have the added time, we don't have the neurotoxicity of all those agents. And then here's, for example, right MCA occlusion, we're working on it. And I can test her as I get the vessel open that she has a functional, not an angiographic uh, endpoint, but actually functional endpoint, which is great. And this is now the meat of this. So despite all these advances in, in therapy, we were missing level one evidence that this worked. And believe me, the naysayers were rubbing it nicely in our faces. Uh, while all these advances were being made, and we we're all working so hard to do this better and faster for our patients, we were stuck in old trials that started enrolling five years ago, and none of these advances were reflected in these trials. So 2013, IMS-3 synthesis, MR rescue. So at the International Stroke Conference two years ago, these were all presented. Now, mind you, thrombectomy was no more dangerous than IVTPA, just not more effective. So we weren't hurting patients, but we're using these 
what they used, they were not using vascular imaging, so they're not identifying patients that had large vessel occlusions, and those are the patients who would stand to benefit the most. So they were not identifying those patients, and they had older generation thrombectomy devices. They were not getting the vessel open nearly fast enough or often enough. And despite all these editorials, you can see here, the failure of, of all three of these trials to reproduce current methods of practice or modern standards of revascularization certainly resulted in a potential benefit of the intervention being diluted. More importantly, these studies' lack of successful revascularization just were not effective. Strongly limits extrapolation of these trials to modern practice because it's just not reflected. And again, just to set the tone, what these negative trials and the, the pressure they had applied on us to produce a positive trial, the reality is that the vast majority of patients in the endovascular arm of IMS3, one of the negative trials, were imaged, triaged, and treated. So all imaged, triaged, and treated using technologies and approaches which are now obsolete. Um, and then lastly, that most of the endovascular patients within the trial actually did not receive contemporary stroke treatment. So fast forward now to the uh, Mr. Clean, which was reported in Europe in December, then the three other trials just last week in Nashville at the International Stroke Conference. Out of the Netherlands, they planned to enroll 500 patients within six hours. Every, the difference here, everybody had a vascular imaging. They had to have a large vessel occlusion confirmed by CTA. Then you had to get that vessel open. You had to be a center that was aggressive in getting the patients to the angio room. You had to prove that you could do it, and you could do it quickly. That was stopped halfway because of overwhelming efficacy. Let me skip the slide here. Um, so you can see th in the intervention group, control, compare the control group along all stratifications improvement in the intervention group. And this is followed by the escape. Again, this was presented just last week. This is a trial that involved the US and Canada, primarily out of Canada. Also, they had planned to enroll 500 patients, very, very similar. And they allowed IBTPA or no IBTPA, whatever the standard um, treatment was at that center and whether they fit the time window. Whether or not they got IBTPA within six hours, if they had a large vessel that was verified in imaging, they went. And you had to have that vessel open within 90 minutes of the, of the CAT scan. You can see huge difference. In fact, the modified rank in zero to two, the quote unquote good outcome, 53% versus 29%, almost a odds ratio almost two in favor of intervention. And importantly here, they've stratified into those that did not get IBTPA and those that got IBTPA. And the intervention, the thrombectomy, had a benefit in both those groups. So often people thought, well, is it IVTPA and then thrombectomy is an adjunct, or if it doesn't work, or afterwards? But in fact, the IVTPA really did not have a, an effect. The overwhelming and the majority effect was derived from the thrombectomy itself, whether or not they had IVTPA. Again, looking at subgroup analysis, things on the right here, favor intervention, favoring medical therapy. I've never seen something like this where it's just one-sided. So there really isn't a side over here. You can look at age, aspect scores, whether there's a tandem occlusion in the carotid, which makes it more difficult and takes longer, doesn't matter. Whether they got IVTP or not, still hugely beneficial for the treatment arm, which poses an interesting question of a potential paradigm shift. I, I see that I run out of time. I think I still have maybe a couple minutes or? Yes. Okay. Traditionally, you know, in, in South Carolina, we have um, the Comprehensive Stroke Center, we're one of the few places that's um, thrombectomy capable. But we have many other hospitals that are IVTPA capable. So traditionally, if you had a patient here with a stroke syndrome, it's shorter, maybe 10 or 15 minute drive to this hospital, maybe an hour, hour and a half to our hospital. Traditionally, IVTPA, it was all revolved around IV, getting IVTPA early. And then later, if they were found to have a large vessel occlusion, then they would be considered for transport to MUSC for thrombectomy. That adds a lot of time. So the thought is now, if, can you cut some of that time? Can you identify patients that have large vessel occlusions? Can you identify the cortical signs? And in fact, bypass this closer IVTPA hospital that does not offer IA. It, it may, again, this is the closest hospital, but can you bypass and actually get the patients quicker to thrombectomy and not necessarily give IVTPA? So that's a, a paradigm shift that's the next controversy, but that's something that's um, the pot's been stirred by the results, particularly from ESCAPE, because again, they, they didn't care if you gave IVTPA or not, and they, that was a genius in their, in their design. They stayed away from IVTPA versus thrombectomy. They said, give, give IVTPA. It doesn't matter, because we know with large vessel occlusions, if we pick them well, and with the study protocol, we were picking them well, 
the thrombectomy would have the overwhelming effect and the IVTPA would show to not be as important, and that's what they showed. And then Extend IA was out of Australia, and they also, very similar design, you had to have vascular imaging, not just a CAT scan, but you had to have a large vessel occlusion, and you had to have a region of penumbra, you had to open up the, uh, the vessel quickly, and you had to be within six hours, and that was also stopped. Um, so th from all corners of the world, it, the US and Canada, the Netherlands and Australia, all these were presented in the last two months, really three of them last week. So just to give you, I mean, it really was a historic week in, in stroke and just positive endovascular trials herald a new day in stroke. You can see four new studies showing dramatically positive results. Again, all powered for 500 patients, all stopped at the midway point. So there was a twice as large effect as they had anticipated. Dramatically positive results on endovascular therapy and acute stroke represent history in the making being the biggest advance in stroke. And then again, three positive thrombectomy trials presented at the stroke conference. And here you go, February 11th, so this person's marking it in their calendars, February 11th, 2015, will be an important milestone in the history of interventional neuroradiology or neurosurgery, if you want to call it that. Three positive trials escape extended IA supreme, evaluating mechanical thrombectomy and acute stroke were presented under the applause, and there was, so that was pretty impressive. Two years ago, with the negative trials, there was applause, and the naysayers were all front center. There was a different crowd this time, but uh, there was applause because these guys really did a great job with these trials. They got it done in a year and a half. These other trials have persisted five, six, seven years. They're using second and third older generation devices. And when these negative trials came out, basically within a matter of weeks, some of these guys really got together and said, we need to change the C, the, the wave of the naysayers. And they got it done within a year and a half. And you have to give them credit. They got it done, and they did a great job with it. And now it's a totally different story. And then they were all published immediately the day of the presentation. They were published in the New England Journal. So very, very exciting. So what's the status? MR, Mr. Clean Escape Extend, they all were stopped early. It would be unethical based on the results to even continue to offer IVTPA for these patients. All major stroke tiles comparing medical versus catheter was stopped between a zero to six hour window. The only stroke trial is ongoing is actually the positive, which is um, PI'd by Cool Turk and Jay Mako. That's but they've stopped enrollment in the six hour window. They're looking at the six or 12 hour window. And the factors distinguish, for example, escape, which I think was the most, the best designed trial, was that there were, again, there was use of imaging, no core infarcts, poor collateral circulation, and a large vessel occlusion. Those that would stand to benefit the most, the ones with the big batch strokes, the ones we can help, we actually were selecting for them. Shorter interval of symptom onset to treatment initiation, get them to the angio suite, sooner and also open it sooner, lower rates of general anesthesia, higher rates of revascularization. Again, sorry I went over, a little bit over the time point, but appreciate it.